What do Falcons do? We rise up. Welcome to Rise Up Reactions, the show where we talk all things Falcons, NFL, Georgia sports, and in general, the sports news of the day. I'm your host, Dr. Lee Denning, the Golden Hard Doc, and a lifelong sports fan, coming back to you today with a little bit of a different topic. You know, the Falcons basically have a completely new offensive, defensive coaching staff. We basically have brought over a coordinator from the Rams, we brought uh, uh, both an offensive coordinator and defense coordinator, and then obviously we are getting. Uh, our coach in Raheem Morris, who was defensive coordinator for the Rams, getting another shot at head coach. But with that in mind, a lot of these moves are being done by management, by the ownership, and not so much by uh, Terry Fontenot, who is our general manager, who's been responsible for a couple of good draft classes and what I would say is a phenomenal free agent signings. Uh, signing period this past year when he finally had an opportunity uh, with good salary cap position to actually make moves where he had been really hindered by dead cap and by bad contracts from our previous GM. Now, the previous GM, Thomas Dimitrov, I just wanted to talk real quick about his legacy because it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, and I would say that it set us up for what we are now. We had a run of where we were competitive, where we were a solid team. But again, just not really the best decisions made, particularly in the draft, uh, in free agency. There were definitely some blunders. There were some good things too, and I'll mention that today. But I just want to say was, you know, the Falcons overall were fairly mismanaged between 2008 and 2020 during the Thomas Dimitrov era. Now, there were only two coaches during that entire time. You had Mike Smith to start out for the first about six years, and then you had Dan Quinn, who ultimately led to the downfall of Thomas Dimitrov, but did take us to a Super Bowl our, and got us as close to winning the Super Bowl as we have ever been. So I will give that feather in the cap to the Thomas Dimitrov era is that we got as close to winning a Super Bowl as we ever have. And the 2014 to 17 years were probably some of the best that we've ever had as Falcons. So I can't take that away from him. But there were still things early on that could have turned our team into a dynasty. And then after that time period that could have continued a dynasty that just didn't happen. A lot of bad scouting and a lot of bad mismanaged picks and, and free agent signings. So let's kind of go off here with a few things. Let's talk about some coaching failures that he had. Uh, Dean Pease's defensive coordinator was a guy that he brought in towards the end of his career. Not really a great option. Dean Pease, while he has a historical record as a good, as a good defensive coordinator, uh, his defense is just too old to actually compete in the current NFL standards. I just don't think he's very good. You had Dirk uh, Cotter, Cotter, I forget how you actually say his name, but he was our offensive coordinator two times. And, again, uh, not particularly good. He wasted a lot of Matt Ryan's career and a lot of Julio Jones's career together. You know, those were years that we probably could have done better. And then you also had um, the hiring of Steve Sarkeesian over Kyle Shanahan or Matt LaFleur, both of whom have gone on to be incredibly successful head coaches and have been offensive powerhouses in the places that they went on to in both San Francisco and Green Bay, respectively. Um, you know, we should have kept them in-house with the plan to have them eventually succeed Dan Quinn or at least have a shot at being a head coach. And we let both of those guys walk and let Steve Sarkeesian, who is now at the University of Texas, didn't even last in the NFL and was terrible when he was with us, let him come in. So we, we had a few things. Those are the ones that really stood out to me from a coaching standpoint. But let's go about and talk back and talk about our free agent stuff. Now, there are some decent free agent signings over the course of time, but I would say the Falcons have not done well from a free agent standpoint during the Thomas Dimitrov era. Let's go back to 2009. Signing Dunta Robinson to a $57, $57 million deal. I think $22 million of that was guaranteed. Never turned into anything that we needed at the corner position. We continued to struggle all the way up until we drafted Desmond Trufant, which is, again, a feather in the cap of Dimitrov. But we'll get to that. You had Ray Edwards at Edge, who, again, was a top free agent prospect in the year that he became a free agent. But he went from having like 11 and a half sacks to not even totaling 11 sacks the remainder of his time with the Falcons. But we ended up signing him for $30 million on a three-year deal. Uh, and then, again, you 
a lot of these numbers don't sound impressive for now. But you got to remember, the cap just went over $200 million about three years ago. Prior to that, the salary cap was somewhere in the $140, $150 million range, particularly as you get closer to the year 2000 and not so much closer to the year 2020. But, you know, these were big, big contracts for that day, things that would – you know, for inflation or NFL inflation here, a $57 million deal would probably be closer to an 80 or $90 million deal in today's NFL. Uh, you know, the Ray Edwards $30 million deal, that's like a 45 to $50 million deal now. Uh, another big one, 2014 Tyson Jackson defensive tackle never turned into anything for us. $25 million over five years. Just not worth the money that we paid to him. You cut John Abraham in 2012, who went on the next year to have over 10 sacks to to end the year or to end his career. He did suffer a career-ending injury at his next location. So it ended up kind of pseudo-working out. But again, John Abraham was one of the hearts of the Falcons' defense in the early 2010s, and you cut him. So that was a big problem. You got John As uh, Asamoa at right guard for $22.5 million in 2014. That was a waste. You had Steven Jackson at the tail end of his running back career coming in to a team that really needed a, another strong back after the Michael Turner years, giving him $12 million, and it didn't end up working out. So Steven Jackson was a bad free agent signing. And then you let Foye Oluokun walk. And I get, I, I get that he is having great success in Jacksonville right now. I hated to see him go because he was a guy that we had drafted, and I would say he was a successful draft pick overall. But we had to let him go because of the next few picks that I'm, or the next few free agent issues I'm going to talk about. So again, a lot of those bad free agent signings happened before 2014. But some of them happened after. And I would say 2014 to 2017 were the best years for Thomas Dimitrov. Overall, we had a record of 108 and 88 with him. Six winning seasons, six losing seasons, one 500 season. Made the playoffs in each of those six winning seasons. But because we made the Super Bowl, and because you end up owing people money after such an incredible run, he made a series of bad bad contracts that haunted us into the first years of Terry Fontenot's reign. The first of those being Matt Ryan in 2017, signing him to a six-year, $150 million deal. That contract haunted us all the way up until this previous offseason. He was probably worth it for the first couple of years. There were some bad things that happened, a lot of injuries, and we just didn't play up to potential. I would say he was worth it for the first three years, but I wish we had not done as long of a deal because when we did finally trade him, we still had $40 million of dead cap on the roster. The, uh, that was one of the few moves that really hurt us. The next one, Devonta Freeman, also 2017 for $41.25 million for I think it was a four or five year deal. He didn't last on the team another two years, and then we ended up owing him somewhere in the neighborhood of $15 million in dead cap for the next couple of seasons. You had Julio Jones, the wide receiver, $66 million in 2019, a guy who was towards the tail end of his career and within two years was gone from the Falcons, again, to a point where two years in a row we owed him $15.5 million not to play for our team. And then finally, the last bad contract that continued to haunt us through the 2022 season was Dante Fowler, the edge rusher, $47 million, three years, and basically, he didn't last after the first season. We continued to owe him. Uh, I think the first year we owed him like maybe seven or eight million dollars, and then we owed him four and a half or five million dollars his last year of dead cap space. So there was a lot of things that set up the 2020, 21, and 22 seasons to be at the cap or above the cap. Then you throw in the fact that COVID happened. The salary cap had been on a straight upward trajectory the entire time, and COVID happens and you have a regression because there's not as much money coming into the NFL because players and fans, or not necessarily players, sorry, but fans can't get to the stadiums, so you're relying completely on TV revenue. You have nothing coming in from the stadium, so you drop everybody's salary cap by about $20 million. So instead of going up, the salary cap not only just stagnates, but crashes. 
and it took another two years for it to go back on that upward trajectory closer to where it was before. And again, we're expecting to have more salary cap this next year. The Falcons are expected to have somewhere between 45 and $50 million of cap that we can play with now that we have a new um, coaching staff coming in to try and either get a quarterback or you or get that through the draft process, bring in free agents that these guys want, maybe get some of these guys from the Rams that have been pretty solid, successful pieces to come over now that we basically have poached three coaches from them. But again, all of Thomas Dimitrov's moves post-2017 set us up for complete and total failure through the first few years of the new general manager's stint. Terry Fontenot had to come in and spin gold out of out of nothing, out of just random pieces the entire time. Cordero Patterson was a solid signing from him just to get him on the cheap. But again, really set us up in a bad position there. So Dimitrov's mismanagement of the early stint and mismanagement of the late stint, I feel like cost the Falcons years in terms of free agent money especially when you see other free agents going to other teams and being successful. The ones that he brought in were just not that. The only good period of free agents that he had at all was 2014 to 2017. And any year before and any year after, I think there were major moves that screwed us up. Speaking of that, the same thing happened during the NFL draft. Let's go back and look at his drafting failures. 2008, first round, we take Curtis Lofton, a linebacker, over guys like Calais Campbell, who went you know, in the second round. Calais Campbell found his way to Atlanta eventually, but my God, can you imagine if we had had Calais Campbell since 2008 or had had him for you know a couple of stints during that time frame for four or five years at a time? How much different the Falcons' defense would have looked during all of those years. You had also in 2008, Sam Baker over all pro uh, tackle Dwayne Brown. A guy, again, I know we got Jake Matthews in there in 2014, but this is early, 2008. We could have had a solid left tackle, somebody who made, I think, four or five Pro Bowls altogether in his career, and we let him pass for a guy that didn't even last on the team. 2009, Pariah Jerry over guys like Clay Matthews and Vontae Davis. Again, these are guys, I'm, I'm trying to keep it within picks that made sense or would have been within a few of where we were taking, but we didn't take Clay Matthews. We needed a linebacker. We didn't take Vontae Davis at, uh, at corner. We needed a corner. We needed a corner, obviously, because in 2009, we ended up paying Dunn to Robinson. You could have had Vontae Davis instead on a rookie deal who ended up being an incredible corner. So 2009, you had that problem. 2010, you took Sean Witherspoon, who I will say contributed to the Falcons while he was with us over guys like Demarius Thomas or Dez Bryant. So again, 2010, you're talking about pre-Julio Jones. You have Roddy White, but can you imagine having Roddy White and Dez Bryant or Demarius Thomas on the team to elevate Matt Ryan's play. Matt Ryan came in in 2008, so I would say that was a really good thing that he did. And again, I said Curtis Lofton. I think that actually might have been a second-round pick. Um, I forgot that we took Ryan first round. I don't remember having two first-round picks in that draft. But we'll keep moving on. But those are the ones that are notable in the early 20s or, or you know, pre-2010s, 2010 era that I think were really just looking back, bad picks, guys that didn't make sense. There were some successes in there. Obviously, 2011, we took Julio Jones. 2013, we got Desmond Trufant. Uh, 2014, we got Clay Matthews. Uh, 2014, we got Devonta Freeman. 2016, Keanu Neal. 2016, Deion Jones. So there are guys that I think are in there that make a lot of sense and were great. But again, they happen later on, and they do contribute to our Super Bowl run. But let's keep going back through here and looking at a few others. So pre-Super Bowl run, Vic Beasley over guys like Todd Gurley and Marcus Peters in 2015. Now, Vic Beasley had an incredible rookie year and then fell off a complete cliff and was bad after that. So I think he had 15 or 16 sacks. It was something ridiculous in his first year, and he just never, ever lived up to that ever again. Never got more than, you know, never got double-digit sacks again during his career. Was We ended up trading him away and... Uh, it was not particularly good signing overall. Uh, then 2017, again, this is kind of what I mark as the beginning of the end of Thomas Dimitrov. Takros McKinley over T.J. Watt. 
TJ Watt went just a few picks after us, and that one hurts because Tackers McKinley was never ever good for the Falcons. We ended up getting rid of him a couple of, or a few years into that contract for pennies on the dollar, and he's not even in the league anymore. So that was a wasted first round pick. Um, 2017, we traded pick number two uh, to Buffalo, who ended up taking Deion Dawkins. We needed a guard at the time, obviously, because the next year or two years later, we end up trying to take a guard and a tackle and end up getting those. But again, we take... We trade away pick uh, the second round pick, which was pick thirty, uh, sorry sixty three, I believe, and they got a Pro Bowl caliber guard, something that we needed and passed on. I don't know why we passed on it because what we got from it didn't end up being anything. We also missed out on Cooper Cup and Alvin Kamara that year, both of which who could have been solid contributors to the team with a declining Julio Jones, um, or with you know Devon, uh, Devonta Freeman who was not particularly good. Kamara went in the fourth round. I mean, you can't tell me that we couldn't have taken him in the fourth round and instead of playing against him two times a year for the last, whatever that is, seven years, he could have been on our team. He could have been torching other teams for us. It just blows my mind there. Then 2019, you took Caleb McGarry over Elton Jenkins. Now, Elton Jenkins can't stay healthy, but has been a better talent than Caleb McGarry. I know we did just sign Caleb McGarry to a three-year deal, but we didn't franchise tag him. We ended up paying him less than what I think we would have had to pay him had he balled out this past year. And I would say he has been he has turned into a solid run defender, but he is not a pass blocker at all. Or I said should say run blocker, my bad. Um, but anyways, Elton Jenkins has been a pro bowler when he's been healthy. Uh, he's still with the Packers. You missed out on Debo Samuel in 2019. You missed out on AJ Brown. You could have used that first round pick on any of those guys, and you end up or that or you know. Yeah, it was towards the end of the first round. You could have done that on any album, and you missed out on those talents. 2020, I don't have a lot of bad things to say about A.J. Terrell, but in 2020, you missed out on CeeDee Lamb, Justin Jefferson, Pro Bowler Patrick Queen, and Pro Bowler All-Pro Trayvon Diggs. A.J. Terrell is not better than Trayvon Diggs. I'm sorry, he's just not. He's good, but he's not better. He still doesn't have a Pro Bowl to his name, and again, he's a guy that we are looking at. What are we going to do with him this year? I, we just did a fifth-year option on him, so you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to extend him? What are, you know, what do we do with his contract? He's a guy that we do need some of the salary cap space to pay if we're going to keep him on the team. But we missed out on guys that I think would have been worthwhile. And then again, I have my own feelings about the 2021 through 2023 draft. I'll talk about those later. The draft successes in the later era that I'll talk about were uh, Chris Lindstrom in 2019. And again, I do have to give credit for A.J. Terrell in 2020. But when I list out all of these things, all I can see is missing Pro Bowl, All-Pro players within a few draft picks of where we were. I don't know if it was the scouting. I don't know if it was Dimitrov overriding. I don't know if it was Rich McKay who was the the general manager before that, finding a way into a CEO position, he was a bad general manager. And again, I don't know why he still has a job with us. He's an important man to have because he is on the NFL, I think it's rules committee. But I don't understand the management. And some of this falls back to Arthur Blank ultimately, but De Thomas Dimitrov was with us for far too long. We gave him too much rope after the, uh, or too much leeway rather, after his Super Bowl run, and he ended up screwing us all the way up until this past season because of that. He did have success with only having two coaches in Mike Smith, who was probably the best coach we have ever had, uh, and just unfortunately didn't make a Super Bowl. And then you also had Dan Quinn, who obviously is a good coach, but obviously has some failures too, as proven this year with his poor defense in the wild card round of the NFL playoffs against the Green Bay Packers with the Dallas Cowboys. So, again, overall a mixed bag, but I would say that there were certain things in the last, you know, in that 12-year time frame that led to poor management and led to poor overall contributions to the Falcons. I think instead of being a perennial mid to lower mid team, we could have elevated ourselves to be a positive mid or, you know, really good team over an entire decade, especially considering for a lot of that decade, you had Matt Ryan, you had Julio Jones, you had guys like Freeman when he was healthy and good. 
if we had had Gurley at any point in time, if we had had some of those guards that we talked about, if the offensive line had been a little bit better, if the defensive line had been just a little bit better, there were winning seasons in that that the Falcons could have taken advantage of. Mike Smith might have ended up continuing his coaching career and might have gotten a Super Bowl run earlier with the Falcons. But again, it wasn't meant to be. These are just thoughts of why I think the Falcons are where they're at. You know, a lot of this contributes to where we are. I'm a history major and a biology major from my undergrad. And history, if the, you know, the main thing that I remember from that and that I've t- taken from that is that the things of the past set you up for the future. And that's just generic history. But you have to look back further than the last few years. You have to look back to the source of your problems. And Thomas Dimitrov is the source of the Falcons' current problems, though the symptoms spread over and bled over into Arthur Smith and bled over into the first few years of Terry Fontenot's reign. And before that, it was Richard McKay. And before that, it really doesn't matter. That Before that, I would say pre-2000, there were some things that happened, but I I would say it doesn't necessarily matter. There were some other issues in there, like um, Michael Vick ending up listening to some people they shouldn't have going to prison. Uh, turning his life around after the fact but again it's all a matter of perspective and as a Falcons Falcons fan looking back trying to be as objective as possible here Thomas Dimitrov made a lot of bad moves for us that really cost us even into the current era I'll do a similar video for Terry Fontenot and the current drafts uh, the last few uh, leading up to this current draft I have feelings on that very strong feelings on how the Falcons have pursued players and what we've pursued in the last three years and what we're going to pursue going forward. Because again, we are in just enough of a bad or just enough of a position, a mediocre position to not be able to probably draft the quarterback we want without giving up the farm for him. But thank you for watching. Thank you for liking, sharing, and subscribing. And as always, rise up.